Well, good morning, Marvin Church. Uh, my name is Doug Baker. I'm the lead pastor here, and uh, Mark Donaldson and I are switching places today as we begin our all-campus sermon series, Faithful God, Faithful Giving. So it's a delight for me to be in this place of worship with you and to share in this time together and to bring the Word of God to us. And uh, so grateful for Mark Donaldson's ministry and for your response to his ministry. And uh, it's so good to see you here today. And those of you in the balcony as well, we welcome you. And those online, we welcome you as well. Would you pray with me? Lord God, in these moments, as your word is proclaimed, I ask that you might hide me now behind the cross, that the words that are spoken may be inspired by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that uh, you would not let us leave this place without being encountered by you and transformed by you through your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last Sunday was a very special day in the life of Marvin Church. It was a great joy after five months of being out in the sanctuary to get back into that special space to share in a reconsecration of that space. Again, for those who may not know, that's, that building, our sanctuary on the other end of the campus, was built in 1890 and is house worship since 1891. So uh, it has held for a very long time been a significant place in the life of this church for worship. And one of the most meaningful times of the consecration service for me was just to kind of recount a little bit of the history, the fact that in 1848, uh, the Methodists were the first of this community to step out and to say they wanted to form their own church here rather than being within the community church. And it was time to do that. The Baptists from First Baptist quickly, three or four weeks later, followed suit with that, and they started their church. Uh, but then in 1890, again, to build that sanctuary, and for the first 11 years, uh, they struggled financially. And and uh, at, one, at one point had to sell the note at the courthouse steps for that beautiful cathedral. And, uh, and so it was just a great story. The way they rallied together, prayed through that, uh, worked through that difficulty and that challenge. And then in, in 1901, they were debt free uh, to pay off that space. So that was a significant day in the life of the church. But one of the things that was most meaningful to me was the faithful God. Incident. I talked last week about all of the people that have been in that sanctuary, that sacred space, for prayer, for worship, uh, to hear the Word of God proclaimed. And we start going through the major historic events of the, the United States, the Great Depression, to go through World War I, World War II, knowing that there were probably people within our congregation that were sending off loved ones to be in harm's way. You know, Vietnam, Korea, all of those significant moments, the civil rights movement, 9-11, uh, we know that that sanctuary was filled as well as this campus, as many of you were in worship after the 9-11 an incident. And so that, just knowing that for all of those years, over 130 years, people have gathered in that space uh, to be in that worship. So grateful, grateful for that. So in all of that, just to say God is a faithful God, and God has been faithful to when people have called upon His name. So Psalm 105 verse 8 is our theme for our stewardship uh, emphasis this, this year. And uh, let me share it with you. It says, God remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. Psalm 105 is a historical psalm. It is a teaching psalm, or using fancy words, it's a didactic psalm. It meant that you gathered people together and worshiped by use of this psalm to tell the story of God's people and how God has been working with his people. And you'll hear, if you read through Psalm 105, maybe this afternoon, in preparation for uh, next week, as Mark will be bringing a similar message uh, to, to you next week from that same psalm, you'll pick up names like Abraham and Jacob. You'll pick up names like Joseph, and you'll talk about names like Moses. And so all of those great heroes of the faith, those Bible stories that we're familiar with, those names that are part of our story, uh, that will be celebrated and lifted up. But this not only is a teaching psalm, not only a historical psalm, it is a psalm that also evokes the praise of his people. So I want you just to listen now for this call to praise, and we've done such great worship today. Praise, the, uh, God, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, verse one, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. 
Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, the, his miracles, the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And I hope that you'll keep that Bible maybe open or your app open, if you will. But just, again, to lift out some of those words. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations all that he has done. Sing praises to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful deeds. And so how will the nations know that we have a great God? unless we tell of his wonderful deeds. And certainly the heroes we've talked about and we'll lift it up in Psalm 105, we'll touch on some of those today. But the question I want to raise, what did it mean to make known among the nations what God has done? Certainly the other nations, Egypt certainly saw what God could do because uh, Moses would have his time to show down Pharaoh and have that, all the plagues and all that. And then the other nations, as they went into the promised land, could see the great God that they had. And even when they were wandering in the wilderness and they were provided with water, they provided manna from heaven, the nations were watching. And I would tell us today, church, People are watching. People are looking at the church and they're wanting to see something different. They're wanting to see a genuine love for a faithful God. And we have a great story to tell them. And that's what I want to focus on today. If we went through Psalm 105 again, we'd hear about Abraham who first heard the call of God to, to go and to leave where he was at, at such an old age and to know that he would be one day arriving in a promised land and he would have great descendants. And we know that he was 99 years of age when finally uh, he would have that first child. And then there's Joseph, who was the son of Jake, uh, Jacob. And we understand that Joseph was uh, somebody who was called uh, to, to go to, well, he's, he's his father thought he was special. Do you remember Joseph's story? He had that special coat of many colors. His brothers despised him because he, he sought visions from God of how great one day he would be. And so what? They sold him into slavery. And so for, for 13 years, he served in Potiphar's house. And then there's that misunderstanding with the Potiphar's wife. He ends up in jail for three years. And then after that time period, God calls him to be in leadership position in Egypt at the right moment. Because what? Israel was in famine. There was no food. And so Abraham's family and Isaac and all that family needed to come to Egypt to have food and to survive. And great were the Israelites going into Egypt where God would bless them there. And then when the time was right, Moses, remember Moses, uh, who was in Egypt and he had killed an Egyptian, has to go into an obscure lifestyle of serving his father-in-law's sheep as a shepherd for 40 years. He's on the sidelines until he, what? He sees a burning bush. God is faithful. God calls up the person he needs at just the right moment. And once again, Moses stands before the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh himself, and declares, God has said, let my people go. And the witness to this power powerful man as they cross through the Red Sea is an amazing witness, and it's a part of our story of salvation as well. And when God would get into the wilderness uh, with his people, and uh, they would have to have water, and they would have to have food, there was manna from heaven, there was water that came out of rocks, God was faithful. He was always leading. He was always calling. He was raising up the people that he needed. And he brought them eventually to the promised land because, friends, God is faithful. Can you just say that with me? God is faithful. And the story of salvation is about a God who is faithful. He shows up when he's needed. He shows up and he sometimes shows off and he allows all the world to see what a powerful God we serve. And that's the faith that we are called to here at Marvin Church. But there's a word I want to talk about today that's a very important word, and uh, Jacob introduced it to you when he talked about the commitment card, which we're calling this year a covenant card, and that is the word covenant. So what was the great story of the Israelites? They had a covenant with the living God. Now, covenant was something that was very ordinary in the day. 
People made covenants. They made treaties with one another. They made formal agreements. So when you think of the word covenant, you think about that, that idea of a formal uh, saying, you, uh, something that's taken serious. It's a deep level of commitment. It's heavy. It means that there's a formal relationship that is established. And we oftentimes will use the word for marriage today in, uh, in our society. We'll say they're in a marriage covenant together. And so that's this formal understanding of being bound together. And that's what the word in Hebrew means. It means to bind or to fetter. The interesting thing, friends, is, is that that word covenant, berit, in the Hebrew is found 285 times in the Old Testament. It was used in all kinds of ways. It was used for treaties and clan alliances and personal agreements and legal contracts and marriage contracts. Every one of those descriptive words I just used can be found in our Bible. So it was a very common word of the day. But yet what was uncommon is that God himself had called himself into covenant relationship, a formal relationship with the children of Israel. And it was about land. It was about blessing. It was about the giving of the law and the call to obedience. So let's just unpack that for just a moment. There's two kinds of treaties. Excuse me, not treaties. There's two kinds of covenants. There's one-sided covenants in the Bible, which we would call um, uh, royalty grants or unilateral covenants. And basically that simply means this. A higher power enters into a promise and you have no commitment back. You just have to accept and be blessed by that covenant. And there's examples of that in the Bible. First of all, Abraham, he did not earn. He did not enter into a formal relationship that he had to do anything other than be in relationship with God, go where God sent him, and go and receive the land and the blessing that he had for him. Another covenant in the Bible we don't often think about, we skip right over it in Genesis, is the covenant that God makes with Noah and with all humanity. Do you remember that covenant? It's the promise that God says, I will never again flood the earth. I will never again destroy the earth. That is a unilateral covenant. There is no two-party agreement. It's not bilateral. It is God making a promise. And we find also here Abraham making this covenant of receiving the land and the promises of that. And when the word kum shows up in Hebrew, it means to establish, which really means that God is bringing a unilateral covenant. A second form of covenant is a bilateral covenant. Now, this is important for us to hear. Moses on the mountaintop gets a covenant relationship with God in the Old Testament and the 10 laws that are given, they're called the 10 commandments. That is a bilateral covenant. Hear this now, that is a bilateral covenant. And if you go and you look at where the 10 commandments are found in the scriptures, and if you study them, you will see a formal contract agreement. People and scholars have identified there's a historical prologue. There is the, the actual giving of what you're supposed to do in the 10 commandments. Then there are blessings that follow that, that say, if you keep this covenant, this is what will happen. And there are curses that will be followed. If you do not keep these rules, this is what will happen. And for the Hebrew people, they were to what? Keep God first, follow all those laws, but they oftentimes messed up on that. When they worshiped Baal worship and other idols, God got angry. The covenant was broken because it was a bilateral covenant. And because of that, what did they do? They lost the land. That's why they went, were deported by the Babylonians. That's why the, the Jerusalem walls were destroyed. That's why the temple was destroyed because God kept his promise. There was a bilateral covenant that was made. You do this, you'll have my blessing. You, uh, you fail at this, you will be punished for it. And these are the things that will happen. So let's just back up for just a moment and go back to Genesis 15. There's a covenant ratification ceremony that's found there. Abraham asked God, how can I know that I'll gain possession of the land? And he's instructed by uh, God, gives instruction to Abraham, go gather a heifer, a goat, and a ram, and sacrifice them. Cut them in half. And when you cut them in half, you spread them out. And what's going to happen is you're going to create a blood path from the animals. And what happens is two parties in a bilateral covenant would walk the blood path. So Animals, if you can imagine on both sides, I'm glad I don't have visual aids with me today. We're going to have a picture in just a moment, but you have this visual, these animals that are uh, cut up and he's walking through the blood path. That is, I think it's coming up on the screen now for you, is uh, what is a much cleaner way to tell the story. 
if you fail at the covenant, you will be like these animals. That's the basic message of a bilateral covenant. But if you look at Genesis 15 and study it, Abraham falls asleep. Hear me very carefully. Abraham falls asleep. He has a vision. And as he has that vision, there's a blazing torch and a smoking fire pot that you can see that crosses through these animals. But guess what? Abraham does not cross through the animals. What is the message there? It is not bilateral. The covenant promise God has made to Abraham and to all his people and his faithfulness forever is a unilateral covenant. And we are pointing to and getting ready for an even greater covenant because today, friends, is World Communion Sunday. We know who the real new covenant maker is, right? Jesus Christ, God in the flesh who came to earth. He laid down his life for us that we might be forgiven of our sin. He has called us into a new family of faith and he has brought us into a relationship where yes, God is always going to be faithful and God will forgive you when you ask for forgiveness and God will make provision for you when you ask for provision because God is a faithful God. World communion, we celebrate the new covenant Christ. In just a moment, uh, Jacob is going to recite the words from Luke twenty two twenty. This cup is a new covenant of my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. God is faithful. God is faithful to us. He wants us to be in relationship with him. He wants to have nothing that would hinder us and he is not going to uh, pull off this covenant or walk away from the covenant because I believe the covenant we celebrate today at this table is a unilateral covenant with Jesus Christ and as the mediator for us because God is the faithful father and his son has walked the blood path with his own shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Roland Faley in a book called Bonding with God says, there is no idea in the Bible that is richer or more fundamental than the word covenant and covenant is the word that holds the Bible together. That's why we are going to lift up today and also this week as we're in study and prayer for our stewardship, this covenant card. Because God's faithful, we will make our faithful promise back to God. So you're going to get a stewardship letter. How many of you already got the stewardship letter? Hopefully everybody did. We got it at my house. I hope it's not buried in your mail pile. The instructions simply are today is to open that letter up from Mark Donaldson and I and actually read that letter, reflect on this passage, think about God's faithfulness in your life. Let that be what begins to move you to a response. And let me just say this as just a side note. Uh, there's some paragraph in there that talks about the expenses, which we all know with inflation and uh, things that are going up in expenses. Just You can't go to the grocery store like you used to go to the grocery store and come home with what you used to get for the same price. It's just the way it is. It's been a very hard time for us. And I just found out from Rick Jett, who's our director of business operations, that because we renewed our electricity contract after five years, that our utility bill at Marvin Church next year, just if we use the same amount of electricity as we've used this year, is going to be $60,000 more. I just want you all to have the perspective of knowing what is happening in your homes is happening in the church as well. So we're asking people to really seriously think about this is a season when we need to give to the church. This is a season when we need to increase our giving to the church if we can grow in our giving. So God is faithful. Think about that. Secondly, just know that uh, uh, we want to prayerfully look over the letter that has been given to us. And on the back of the letter, you will find two charts, and you'll see them here on the screen. One is a percent of giving, because proportionate giving is what I think is biblical in the New Testament. Apostle Paul talked about proportionate giving. The Old Testament talked about the tithe. That is a proportionate giving, giving 10% of what you make or your income. And so let me just talk about that for just a moment. A few words about tithing. People say, Tithings, that's Old Testament. Jesus brought freedom and grace, and we don't need the Old Testament. That's, that's the old school way. Let me just clarify something. Abraham was called by God to a land to be shown him, and when he encounters in, in Genesis 14, Melchizedek, the high priest, a mysterious priest that just shows up, and how does Abraham respond? 
Abraham gives 10% to that priest. And then we have Jacob who has his dream in Bethel. Do you remember? He's got this ladder and uh, these uh, angels are descending and they're ascending and God is at the top of the ladder. God reminds him that there is a promised land that he will eventually inherit. And so uh, he makes an altar of stones and there it says in the scriptures, I think it's in Genesis 28, 22, as I set up a pillar for God's house for all that you've given me, I will give one-tenth. Then you come to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is what we call the constitution of the Old Testament, uh, the constitution of God's people. As they came into the promised land, they had their constitution. Deuteronomy 12, 5, and 6 is, as you go to the place the Lord will choose, bring your tithe. Now, friends, I want to just make an honest confession to you. It would have been really nice if Jesus had said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who tithe, because they'll have all that they need. Wouldn't it have been great if he had just said that? I wish he would have, because it would have made it very clear for the church that that's what we need to do. But I think Jesus was not about laws and religiosity and setting real strict things. I think he was about a movement out of your heart and gratitude. But he says in uh, uh, Luke eleven forty two, 42, you tithe, but you disregard justice and the love of God. You should have done these things without neglecting the other. Jesus is calling the Pharisees out in this moment. He's saying, you guys are all about the tithe, showing up with the tithe, being all flashy about giving to the Lord, but you're forgetting to do justice to your neighbor and you're forgetting about the love of God. You should be doing both. That's about as close as we can get to nailing down Jesus that he gives a nod to, yes, that the, the tithe is a good thing. So I'm going to just challenge the church. I'm going to challenge the church to consider the tithe, to grow towards the tithe, because I still believe the tithe has a place in the church and is needed in the church today. And Jesus never came out and said it was not something that he wanted to have done by the early church under the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's my example. I go to the doctor, I have a physical, I get a lab checkup. I know where my blood levels are at and I know where my growing edges are and what I need to do. So hold that thought. Now hope, just hope you think and in your minds think about Doug wants to run a marathon. I'm borrowing this example from John Mark Comer, practicing the way. If I was going to run a marathon, if I decided to do that right now, I would probably hurt myself terribly if I went and tried to run a marathon next week, right? What do you have to do to run a marathon? You have to train for it. And one of the things that Adam Kovach and I in our class have been learning and practice about practicing the way. You've got to come up with a plan and you've got to practice. And John Mark Comer gives an example about you run a mile for six days every day and then you take off the Sabbath day and then the next week you run two miles and then you uh, take off the Sabbath day and then the next week you run three miles, and then you take off. The, and so many of you, if you've ever run and done competitive running, you know you have to train and do these certain things in order to give yourself what? The capacity for your body to change so that you can accomplish the goal. Great example. I think of the commitment card. I think of stewardship every year in the church as going to the doctor, getting a checkup of where you are and realizing where do we need to grow? Do I need to make some changes? If I need to make some changes, if I'm giving it 3%, why don't we as a family commit to 4% this year? Or then the next year, 5%. Let's grow towards the tithe. The reason I share this, because here are the statistics of Americans today. Americans give 1.1 to 1.4% of their yearly income away. Okay, now I love the fact the way these numbers fall out because American Christians give 1.5 to 3.1%, so we're a little bit above that, okay? Four out of 10 church attendees, it says, give nothing to their local church. One of 10 give a constant percentage. That means they're giving regularly, weekly, or monthly, or annually a percentage of their uh, income. And then this last one, the national average of people who tithe is 4%. Now, Adam and I have been doing this Practicing the Way book together, teaching it to the church, and we've discovered that 63% of Americans claim to be uh, Christians, but only 4% are actively practicing what was determined by the Barna Research as a Christian lifestyle, which would be probably a regular Bible study, giving regularly to the church, um, you know, serving in some capacity, worshiping God regularly. Only 4% of Americans 
This should be a wake-up call for us, friends. We can no longer have the, the call of God in our lives to be a witness to our community, to change our world and our community for Christ if we are living in these parameters. So this is what I love. We're sending you a tool. What's come into your home by the U.S. Postal Service is a tool for spiritual growth, and that's what it is. It's not about getting money for the church, and forget about the example I gave about the utilities. It's not about so we can pay a higher utility bill. It's about you growing in your faith in Jesus Christ, because that is the mission of Marvin Church, that you are transformed to becoming more of a Christ-like person for Jesus Christ and a kingdom builder in this world. The world needs us to do this, and in order to do that, if you're in a 2 or 3% giving range, then this is the opportunity. You've been to the doctor, figure out where you are and start practicing and growing towards becoming someone who ties. I believe that God can be honored by us growing in a way that strengthens the church, strengthens our witness, and helps us do so much more for our children, for our youth, for all of the members of Marvin Church. What's our motivation? God is a covenant maker. God is a faithful God, and he has called you and me to be faithful in our giving. Let's pray. Almighty God, I know I just laid a bunch of stuff out here for this congregation to chew on, and uh, some of it's challenging to us. But Lord, we need to change. We need to grow. We need to become all that you desire for us to be, to be more like Christ, so the church will be the most powerful institution of transformation on this planet. The world needs the church, and our community needs the church, Lord. So come, Lord Jesus, do a good work, and we give you the praise and the glory ahead of time. We look forward to next week, to the way in which you will be changing people's lives as they prepare for our Commitment Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.